AI has made it tough to figure out what's for real and what's fake. What did that congressman just say? Did he really say it? One Idaho lawmaker is trying to get ahead of that technology when it comes to political campaign ads. One week, it's a resounding success. The next, it's on the chopping block. Idaho's Empowering Parents program seems to be the fat the governor is willing to cut when budget revenues come in lower than expected. All right, here we go. <laughs> that helped. Now we're cooking. Getting from A to B with half a foot of snow on the ground can be tricky. And with so much piling up in some areas, just getting out of A or into B can be a challenge in itself. It is an election year, which means you can soon expect to be inundated with political ads on TV, online, on your socials. Now, this day and age, in a growing age of artificial intelligence and deep fakes, how do you know if you can trust those election videos? This could lead to breakthroughs and negative ads showing you something that may or may not have been said by a campaign competitor. Well, one such future campaigner, an Idaho lawmaker, she has an idea to protect such things from happening. Joe Paris has the details on a bill hoping to address a different form of an election integrity. The wild west of the internet isn't new. There's a lot out there. Technology, though, continues to evolve. The intersection of advancing technology and politics in an election year? Yeah, that's quite a crossroads. Everybody's used to kind of some baloney flying around election season, right? And some misleading flyers. I think we're all acclimated to that and expect it to some extent. House Minority Leader Alana Rubel is keeping a close eye on technologies and how they interact with political campaigning. With the advent of AI and deep fakes, I think it's a qualitatively new level that we're going to be looking at heading into the future that really needs to be addressed. If you aren't familiar with new technologies, it's fair to say that a kid with an iPhone could make some high quality fakes. People saying things they never did, on video, in high definition. The kid, great. Never mind a politician or political organization. Your voice and your appearance and basically generate a video of you saying who knows what, saying, you know, I'm a communist or I like to molest children or who knows what. They could make that video so realistic that it would deceive anybody, that it would deceive your own family members. It's an election year, so ahead of major campaigning, Rubel and Republican co-sponsor Bruce Skog have legislation to try and rein in fakes. It basically says, if you're going to do this, disclose it. So you can still make these deep fakes. You can still make fake videos, fake audios, fake radio ads where you impersonate a person's voice and have them say things they never said, but you have to prominently disclose it so that the public knows that what they're seeing is not reality. So why not just ban the use of AI and manipulation in campaign ads? Well, it's a complicated space. There are a lot of First Amendment concerns. You know, generally we have to be very careful when we're regulating speech and expression. Um, but if you do it in a manner that makes it okay as long as you disclose what you're doing, then I think you don't run afoul of the, of the First Amendment. The proposed law opens an avenue for media to be taken down if there is no disclaimer that footage and sound bites are altered. You can sue, you can get an injunction, so you can block them from putting it out there. Um, there's language in there encouraging the, the courts to take quick action because the speed is really an issue. Some of these things drop three or four days before the election and you don't have time to put together an ad to counter it or to really get on air and, and reach all the people who were misled. Okay, so about those disclaimers, acknowledging that a clip for speech has been altered, Rubel says they need to be very clear according to the law. If it's a visual medium that you're seeing, if it's a video, um, then the uh, there has to be written disclosure very prominently displayed throughout the entire ad in large, clear, easy to read writing. If it's an audio, if it's on radio, then you need to have it clearly. It can't be one of those quick mumbly things you hear at the end of, uh, <laughs> of pharmaceutical ads. <laughs> um, it has to be very clearly spoken in a very audible volume at the beginning and at the end of the ad. And if the ad is longer than two minutes, then they also need to disclose in the middle in case somebody missed the disclaimer at the beginning and the end. Rubel says this bill is a push for election integrity in the face of a new and easier to access technology. I think it would really upend our elections and really undermine the integrity of our whole uh, democratic republic and how people vote. So I think it's really important to get out ahead of that and make sure that what people are seeing is real. So the next step for this legislation is to have some debates and maybe a vote, maybe next week, on this exact idea. And there is bipartisan support in the House, and we believe the Senate, so good chance that we do see some movement on it. You have politicians who want to campaign, but realize this is a major obstacle, no matter what the political party is. And Brian, uh, with campaigning, 
basically already starting. I was curious if Rubel would maybe have one of those clauses at the end of her legislation that says, okay, if this gets signed by the governor, it needs to go into effect right away. Again, we emergency clause. Emergency yeah. clause, yeah. She says that as of now, the law is supposed to go into effect on July 1st if it passes and all that, but she said she wouldn't be opposed if someone who wanted to change that and have it go into effect sooner. So basically, she wants to take deep fakes and make them not so deep when it comes to campaign ads. Yeah, basically have someone acknowledge, hey, we faked this video. I don't know what that means in terms of strategy, where yeah. if I had Brian Holmes out here, I'm like, here's what Brian said, but he didn't really say it. Then there's no value of it, but yeah. maybe that's the idea. That's the whole point. Take the power. So, thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. Two weeks after calling the Empowering Parents pro Grant Program a success, after an external audit found families only misused $40,000 of the $40 million given out, Governor Brad Little is about to end it. This was an idea that was floated yesterday during the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee meeting. Granted, the grant program is only a couple of years old, but those behind it, like the governor and the state superintendent, they both were touting how it helped more than 45,000 Idaho families, quote, fill the gap by giving them up to $3,000 to buy supplemental educational supplies. It began as a federally funded program and was a product of the pandemic to help families overcome learning loss during that time. But last year, based on its success, the program was funded by $30 million in state dollars. However, just like that trip to Disney, extras are one of the first things to go when the gem state's income levels are also no longer boosted by the pandemic. We have first on the agenda, Mr. Alex J. Adams. The state's Adams. administrator of the Division of Financial Management, basically the Gov's budget guy, and, uh, Alex Adams was in front of JFAC Wednesday to offer what is usually a formality, a the governor's budget revisions. This year we also did um, add what we called a conditional revision. Revisions are expected. The economy is returning to normal. Idaho has seen revenue growth, but at pre-pandemic levels. After Governor Little introduced his $5.3 billion budget on the first day of the legislative session, sometimes there are mistakes or items just left out. So week two of the session is usually when those things are corrected. And sometimes the money the governor thinks he has to spend is a bit off. Revenue forecasting is a fancy way of saying revenue guessing. The Division of Financial Management Executive Revenue Projection. Which is where the Economic Outlook and Revenue Assessment Committee comes in. Um, you've seen the governor's number. So Iraq recommended a revenue projection of $5.59 billion, which is 1.7% below uh, the budget that the governor's office submitted. If budgets are a balancing act, when the revenue comes down, well, you're forced to recalibrate. A week ago, the state expected to finish the year with an ending balance of about $265 million, the required rainy day fund. But with current revenue expectations lower, that number is closer to $200 million. So to get there, Adams had two recommendations for JFAC. Lower the expectation of the rainy day fund, which is supposed to be 15% of revenue. That's the first. And then the second, we recommended that uh, the program that could be eliminated is the Empowering Parents program. The Empowering Parents Program, which has helped more than 45,000 Idaho families overcome learning loss and education deficiencies after the pandemic. Ending that program would return $30 million a year the state gave the program last year. The elimination of that would get the ending balance up to $200 million ongoing, maintain that uh, structural balance uh, over time, and ensure that uh, this budget remains balanced over the five-year uh, forecast. So. Budget meetings are so exciting, aren't they? Okay, so what happens to those families who have signed up for the Empowering Parents program since, like, November? Which we learned was about 24,000 families hoping to supplement more than 47,000 students. Will it end immediately, or will it continue through July, which is the end of the fiscal year? We asked those questions of the program coordinator, and we were directed to the governor's office. And as for Governor Little's office, they said with the adoption of a lower revenue forecast by the legislature's economic outlook and revenue assessment committee, the governor has put forth options to balance the budget. That's it. That's all they said. Here are your options. One of two things. We also heard from State Superintendent Debbie Critchfield, who said, while I've been a proponent of the Empowering Parents program, I recognize that this type of scrutiny is par for the course during a legislative session, and we as a state are not in the same financial position as we have been in the past few years. It's worth mentioning the cut is just a recommendation right now and someone could come up with a solution to keep it. We'll see. Plus that new revenue forecast that is lower than it was two weeks ago is still being waiting to be accepted finally by JFAC. Okay, so imagine you own a business. Let's say you build custom cabinets and you a customer hires you to do that. So you do that. 
But now that customer wants you to build him a house. And oh yeah, he doesn't know how he's gonna pay you to do it. Now imagine if someone told you, you had to do it anyway. That's the dilemma Chad Daybell's attorney is facing. Shira Matsuzawa explains in today's 411 from around the 208. A judge denied Chad Daybell's attorney's motion to be removed from Daybell's death penalty case today. John Pryor, who has been Daybell's attorney since his arrest in 2020, says Daybell couldn't pay him and that he is unqualified to argue a death penalty case. During the hearing, the judge expressed concerns that allowing Pryor to leave the case would delay the trial. Daybell is accused in the murders of his wife's two kids, JJ and Tylee, along with his late wife, Tammy Daybell. His trial is expected to start in April in Ada County. A man died after a shooting in Ontario. The Malheur County Sheriff's Office says it happened around 3.40 on Tuesday afternoon. They say a 911 call was made about shots fired in an area known as the Flats. 40-year-old Daniel Mendoza Olvera, who lived at the camp, was found with gunshot wounds and died from his injuries. Police are still investigating. A new piece of art was installed at the Idaho State Capitol building today. A mural honoring the lives of women veterans from Idaho was painted in the basement tunnel of the State House. The mural tells the stories of many of the women who have fought for our country. I'm Shira Matsuzawa, and that's your 411. How many of us woke up this morning, thought the same thing? After stepping outside and seeing what Mother Nature has left, not just on your doorstep, but basically all over the city, did you wonder how this was gonna work? Getting to work, getting around town without allowing the ice and snow to get in the way. From your driveway to any other parking lot, it's a hot spot to bottom out and lose traction. A lot of people found themselves in that same boat today. And as Andrew Bartline learns, some of them may as well have had a boat. The banks on Boise Arterials are proven to collect more plaque than this plaque can keep up with. We've, had, we've pushed two people out already this morning. Tom Gold's been at it all week. We're not young people either. And they're not even here for the same reasons. You ready for round two? John Hoy owns <laughs> the business next door. Yeah. Where normally he could write you the book on relaxation. I would think that people would want a hot tub on a day like this, wouldn't you think? <laughs> But his novel concept today is to ensure customers can even get to the front door. It's just baby steps. Just stay on top of it and get it done. Urgent, but no emergency. And unless you get like eight inches, you know. That's reserved for the other business on the block. So we got a special today, two boxes for the price of zero. <laughs> the City Hope Food Pantry's need has doubled in recent years. But today? Because of the snow, Having, it's been quiet. People are having problems getting in. But the bigger problem an old lady backing up. might be getting out. Uh, are you surprised to see who came to help? <laughs> in a pinch. <laughs> in an emergency. All right. Because the pantry's learned. We're going this way. Their strength yeah. 
in community. All right, here we go. Yes. Sort of. The other way. Other way. Other way. Other way. Other way. Other way. Stop right there. Right there. Okay. Hit the gas hard. But what matters? Yeah. That worked. Is helping people. That's the first time I've had so many good-looking guys paying attention. Emergency averted. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Whoa. Stop. Thanks to a yeah, lucky off. break. Yeah, this break was fully engaged. <laughs> it helps when the back tires can spin too. I don't have to go to the gym today. But plenty still need to come to the pantry, where Tom's team is hard at it, knocking down the snow at its highest, helping people at their lowest. It doesn't look like much. It's kind of a small little place, but a lot of things happen out of here and not much of the community knows what goes on, but we touch a lot of lives, a lot of hurting lives. They made significant progress when we got there within just a few minutes. They knocked down that berm to be something that could actually be drivable, but the problem is you create Brian, when they have that, I don't want to call it a snow blower. I, I guess it kind of is, it's electric. Snow thrower? The th snow thrower, they throw the snow to the middle, yeah. and then it just creates a whole new problem. There. Sure, it does. I thought it was funny. I mean. Rick texted in after seeing the video teasing that story, yeah. saying it helps to take your foot off the brake or at least take the brake off. Yeah, the off. emergency brake was on. How did that happen? <laughs> so you don't notice that she was out of the car. Yeah. At some point she got out, and I assumed it was her husband got in the car. Okay. She was probably being thoughtful, put the emergency brake on. He got in, didn't know. And then for the next 10 minutes, me and her photographer, Kevin, are just watching them push this car. We're too stupid. Like a sled. But we're too stupid to realize the fact that I start turning. This is the whole thing. That's amazing. But they're good. The lot's looking better, and if you need to get to the food pantry, they put in a lot of work to ensure that people can if it's yep. needed. Working on the snow at its highest to help people at their lowest. That's yeah. good. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks.
we are looking at a change in our weather pattern happening and you can see that warmer air starting to work its way in melting the ice from the camera over at Bogus Basin and you can see they picked up two inches of snow by the, about three and a half inches of snow by the way today Tamarack on um, the upper side of the totals at four and Sun Valley an inch and a half and we did hit a big marker for Boise today made it above freezing for the first time in six days but you can see there are a few other places that are still below freezing in the Western Treasure Valley at this point so you can see the road are melting now, not quite as icy, but as we dip back below freezing later tonight and tomorrow morning, just know that those roads will be turning straight back to slick. So we do have a chance of some more freezing rain today, but it is in less areas that we were talking about yesterday. However, we could be seeing a little bit of a freezing drizzle over in Ontario right now, and that looks to continue to be the case as we go throughout the evening hours and after and overnight hours. A few isolated spots in the Treasure Valley could see that in some areas towards Cambridge northeast of Ontario could also see that as well. But we are sticking with this active pattern. As you can see, more moisture is expected to be on the way. We have chances of that freezing rain lingering Saturday and Sunday for valley locations. Otherwise, we'll be talking about rain as temperatures warm. Well, as we just showed you, drivers and those whose chore is shoveling snow, well, they haven't been a big fan of the last few days. Boise has had almost a foot and a half of snow this past week. But you know who has been a big fan? That'd be Idaho's mountains and ski resorts. In the valley, we're measuring it in inches, while they're measuring it in feet up there. For example, Bogus Basin, well, they've gotten almost three feet of snow in the last seven days. Mountain even sold out of its lift tickets last weekend, and all of the day passes for this upcoming Saturday, well, those, they are sold out too. For real, though, Bogus has been one of the main attractions of the Treasure Valley since World War II. It opened in 1942 with a delay because of World War II, and they opened with only a 500-foot tope a rope, a rope tow. The first chairlift was installed in 1961. Idahoans have been taking trolls up the hill and shredding the slopes above Boise since. But did you know, back in 1997, Bogus almost got a new name? Here's John Miller in today's 208 Redial. It's not that Jeffrey Jensen hates the name Bogus Basin. Which I think it's mostly, uh, I feel that it's uh, uh, a not a good name for the resort. So he wrote a letter to the statesman suggesting we rename Bogus Basin to what? Deer Point, uh, Doe Point, that sounds good to me. Doe Point, that doesn't sound too good. I think we better keep it a Bogus Basin. A bogus Basin is Boise. It's been Boise for 50 years during those cruising 50s, right up through those cheesy 70s. The music was bogus, the fashion was bogus, and the skiing was bogus, just as it is today. Director of Skier Services Eric Stigmeyer agrees we could call it something like Deer Point. Or Doe Point, but uh, it really sort of takes the flavor out of it. The flavor of the Old West, the legend of Jughead Jake and Panhandle Pete, who discovered gold in the area back in 1860, although it turned out to be fool's gold, or bogus. Still, the two prospectors took their phony riches to Boise, where they whooped it up before disappearing back into the basin. Those days are long gone, but the legend lives on. You know, gosh, I know that people go, oh, God, that's bogus, but you know, bogus means something to us. A bogus basin, Boise, all the bees, three bees, hey, can't get any better than that. Sounds like a good name to me. It's totally bogus, <laughs> and, and we love it even if Jeffrey Jensen doesn't. I just feel that it, uh, it's an injustice to what a nice place that it is. Jeff, come on, get all, get with it, huh? Who, hey, Bogus Basin, whatever it's called, is beautiful up here. And if it was bogus enough in the 70s, it's gotta be bogus enough now. I mean, we're talking bogus. It's, it's part of us. John Miller, Idaho's News Channel 7.
All right, let's get right to your comments. Jack wants to know, could the rainy day fund be reduced to cover the Empowering Parents Fund because of the budget shortfall or the revenue projections being lower than they should? Actually, it's by law that it has to be 15% of revenue. So I don't think that's going to be a possibility. What constitutes a rainy day, asked Jack? I don't know exactly, but I know that question was asked a lot during the pandemic, and I don't know that we even really dipped into it then. The first money to come out of the budget should be the millions in the defense fund for the legislators' unconstitutional laws passed every year, says David. Unfortunately, that's probably going to be a pretty big necessity. Uh, let's go to the next one here. Every budget for every state is guesswork. Idaho's GOP legislature has been very good at the lowest worst case possible revenue projections, which is why the state has a huge revenue surplus every year in recent memory and why Idaho services suffer every year, says Steve. The car being pushed out of the snow at the start of your broadcast had its emergency brake on. The back wheels were not turning, says Russ. Russ wasn't the only one to notice this. As I mentioned, Rick also noticed this. Pushing car to the snow, be helped take your foot off the brake. Look at the rear tire. Why didn't Kevin... Our photographer and Andrew noticed these things, and the guys pushing the car, don't know. They just didn't, but you did. Good for you. Idaho Capital finally acknowledging female veterans with a mural that is in the basement. This, too, shows the importance and significance of women in Idaho. So sad, says Rhonda. Thanks for watching. We'll be back again tomorrow.